Chancellor, Vice Chancellor, graduates, ladies and gentlemen, this this very great honour which you've bestowed upon me is deeply appreciated, and the more so since it was here in this institution that it all started. So it is an institution to which I owe a huge debt. Now whether or not I deserve it is debatable, but I'm going to enjoy it nevertheless. But in doing so, I'd also like, like to make uh, reference to the many colleagues at Arab who helped me along the way. I'm exceedingly grateful and this is a prize you get for longevity. Now I'm also very sad not to be able to be there and in person and to make this address in person and to receive it in person. On the other hand I wasn't comfortable sitting on my sofa at home making the speech so I've recorded it. I've recorded what I want to say to you. Uh, but before doing so, I'd like to tell you a story which uh, has, I hope, has some re relevance. It's, it concerns an institution not unlike this one, where the Vice Chancellor was presenting degrees to the graduates, and he was shaking hand after hand and was getting rather boring, so he thought he'd make some conversation. And when it came to a young lady who was the student of the year who ran away with all the prizes, he said to her, congratulations, and I said, what are you going to do next? And she rather coyly said, well, I'm thinking of going home. Now, I think you all would like to go home and not listening, listen to some old fogey holding forth about education, but that's what I'm going to do because it's the one thing that's been a passion of my life, well, most of my life anyway, and there's some thoughts which I'd like to share with you. Uh, I graduated shortly after World War II. It's difficult now to describe the euphoria, the immense sense of elation and relief which engulfed us all. There was a universal feeling that something very evil had been overcome. Despite the dawn of the Cold War, there was a worldwide consens consensus of optimism, fueled by perhaps a naive belief that the benefits of technology were only just beginning to pave the way for a utopian future for all mankind. Naive in the context of hindsight 70 years later, there were literally no obvious limits to growth, or so most people, particularly young idealistic enthusiasts, thought at the time. At the same time, society was more ordered. There were more accepted co codes of conduct, influenced strongly by the family, by religion, and by social convention, than there appears to be the case today. Now, these so-called accept accepted values coupled with the optimism in the future of mankind, gave us all a sense of security, maybe a false one, but nevertheless a kind of reassurance of one's place in the world. Now, I don't want to give the impression that it was a perfect world, far from it. A great deal of the religious and family coding I referred to was more a matter of habit than, than, than conviction instinct rather than logic, a reassuring facade perhaps behind which there was much artificiality, hypocrisy and sham. So I'm clearly not offering the platitude that life was better. That's the delusion of older men and recipients of honorary degrees. What I am emphasizing is that you are, you are graduating into a vastly different world, no less thrilling, no less challenging, at a world in which education is not just a preparation for life, but it's generating current. Seventy years ago, education was considered not so much 
a right as a privilege, happily a far cry from today's standards. Secondary education was thought to be a bonus, while tertiary education was for the few. After obtaining a degree, one was expected to go out into the world and earn one's living. All that was required was to gain that magical experience. The world today, as we all know, is vastly more complex. The global population has more than tripled since I graduated. Now, if you say it quickly, it doesn't hurt. But just stop and think about how these burgeoning billions have brought acute and critical problems over and above those we faced when I graduated. Pollution in all its threatening manifestations is high on the agenda of human survival. My generation didn't have to cope with global warming and holes in the ozone layer, nor did one talk about the quality of life. Nobody thought the unthinkable. The question of human survival on this planet, the question which is certainly being asked today. We all live in societies run on the free market principle, with its benefits as well as its problems, particularly its veneration for acquisitive habits. We also now live in a global village where rapid physical transportation is taken for granted, where communications have become bewilderingly instantaneous. We appear to demand information before it actually exists. All this has to be seen in the context of a society which, if does not question traditional moral and ethical values, certainly seems to flout them more and more. A society where social conventions no longer provide the secure boundaries they were once thought, they were once thought to be. And I'm not saying this with a feeling of nostalgia. Looking back over one's shoulder is a dubious exercise, resulting more in a stiff neck than enlightenment. I'm saying that despite the problems I've referred to, many of them self-inflicted, today's world offers immense benefits and opportunities. It's a typical example of the yin-yang of life, the positive and the negative. We can live happily and productively with that, provided we understand that in this contemporary world, education and a consequent understanding of the world around us is perhaps the only guiding star in an otherwise featureless landscape, the only reliable signpost in a bewildering confusion of false trails and dead ends. I said earlier that not so long ago, secondary education and certainly tertiary education conferred a kite mark, a stamp of permanent approval by society on its recipients. Today, that is no longer so. Greater personal responsibility, the necessity for self-control, self-awareness, and particularly self-discipline, means that an understanding of the world around us is immensely important, and the concept of lifelong learning is an essential ingredient of a civilized society, like food, shelter, and clothing. Trite aphorisms, like you learn something new every day, or even a quotation by Winston Churchill, Personally, I'm always ready to learn, although I do not always like being taught, have abounded, making an implicit sta statement that learning is a lifelong experience. But explicit articulation for lifelong learning is a relatively recent phenomenon and arises as much out of need as of desire. The explosion of knowledge in nearly all disciplines creates the necessity for lifelong learning. This is now being formalized in that more and more professional institutions required as a condition of continuing membership. This formal requirement for evidence of continuing professional development, or CPDs as is now known, is on the increase and will soon encompass most professional and vocational walks of life. So that lifelong learning, formal or informal, the concept of education from the cradle to the grave, is now with us, and we must brace it wholeheartedly. 
But there's another aspect to education which is particularly relevant to scientists and engineers. General Sir John Monash, who was the Commander-in-Chief of the ANZAC, the Australian New Zealand, Force, New Zealand Forces in, in Europe in World War I, not, was not a professional soldier. He was a distinguished engineer who came into military service through a part-time participation while a civilian in Victoria. After the war, when his fame as a brilliant military strategist had propelled him into the upper reaches of public life, one of the positions to which he was elected was that of part-time Vice-Chancellor of Melbourne University. His strongly held views on many aspects of education were well articulated. The professions in Australia were at that time dominated by narrow, poorly educated men without much cultural background, a situation which is mirrored even today in several countries I can think of. Monash said, the greatest mistake in life is to specialise education too early. Nothing is more absurd than for a boy or girl of 14 years to decide what calling he or she shall pursue. The first essential is to be an educated human being. When such foundations have been laid, it is time enough to select a walk of life. We should have a knowledge of the laws of nature, of the history of civilization and of art music and literature. To whatever extent we lack these things, to that extent is our vision and outlook limited and cramped. Now this was said by Monash in 1923 and we can well reflect how even more relevant this need is today than it was more than 90 years ago. Science and in particular technology are today under constant public scrutiny and criticism and rightly so. Gone are the days when the wonders of science and technology, which at one time promised to guide us to utopian heights undreamt of in the pre-industrial era, are accepted without question and debate. Science and technology can be seen to be a threat to humanity. On the other hand, civilization will only survive by what intelligent interpretation and application of what science and technology have to offer. It is therefore ever more necessary for engineers and scientists to have a comprehensive understanding of the world in which they live and which they serve. This contextual knowledge can only be acquired by broadening the educational base. History, and particularly history of their chosen discipline, and its relationship to society, philosophy, literature, modern languages, not to mention economics and sociology, are all important contextual disciplines for engineers and scientists. There may at present not be enough time in most university programs for scientists and engineers to encompass a broad education in the humanities. Whether or not it is possible to widen undergraduate programs to accommodate greater breadth in education is for others to judge, but I'm quite sure that if scientists and particularly engineers wish to play their proper role in the society which they serve, then generally educational breadth must be coupled with the narrow education of their chosen discipline. South Africa needs a large cohort of appropriately educated and trained engineers and scientists. The challenges are huge, but so are the opportunities. In 1920, H.G. Wells, in his book The Outline of History, said, an education will go throughout life. It will not cease at any particular age. This was Wells's way of presaging lifelong learning. But he goes on to say a few pages later that human history becomes more and more race between education and catastrophe. Prescient words written more than 90 years ago. These words may sound dramatic, but they propose a fascinating concept for you to take home with your degrees. Race between knowledge and Armageddon. Well, it is a race, of course, which civilization has to win. I believe passionately that education in all its forms offers humanity its greatest hope. Good luck.